You're listening to the Play Therapy Podcast with Dr. Brenna Hicks, your source for centered and focused play therapy coaching. Welcome to the Play Therapy Podcast. This is a unique scenario because we typically don't do video podcasts, but I'm so excited that today we are interviewing Dr. Jennifer Baggerly, who has such a special place in my heart. So I'll share a little bit more about that in the moment, but I'm so excited to have a chance to spend some time with her today. And I know that you will greatly benefit from this experience because I have benefited so much from her in my life. So Dr. Baggerly, thank you. Welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you. Oh, I'm so excited. So if you don't mind, some of our listeners are very well aware of you because I talk about you a lot. But for (laughs) those that may be new to the field or new to the podcast, if you could just kind of share a little bit about who you are and introduce yourself a little bit so they can get to know you. Sure. Great. Thank you for having me again. So I'm Dr. Jennifer Baggerly, and I'm a uh, professor of counseling and play therapy at the University of North Texas at Dallas, and I'm also a practicing licensed professional counselor and registered play therapist supervisor at Kaleidoscope Behavioral Health in Flower Mound, Texas. I also do some supervision and such online, and so I've been a play therapist and counselor for over 30 years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just, uh, I, I hate saying that because it really makes me feel old, but <laughs> it's been an absolute joy to be in the field of play therapy that long. And I have a daughter and Brenna was with me on my journey as I adopted my daughter from Kazakhstan, an international adoption. And she uh, saw her when she was little itty bitty. And now she's 18 years old and she's thriving and and just uh, doing great and interested in uh, creating and producing children's cartoons. So, you know, the Apple doesn't fall far from the tree and oh, it sure doesn't. working with children. <laughs> so. That's so awesome. Yeah. So really quick story about Caitlin. You, uh, you brought her to several of the classes. I remember you had to change her diaper on the floor of the lab. So yes. <laughs> I, I vividly remember those early yes. days. <laughs> yes, she, yes, indeed. She grew up with play therapy. She, I would take her to so many of my uh, classes when she was little, as you remember, and, and she and her uh, friends would uh, be the, the subjects for play therapy. And she just has grown through it. And as a matter of fact, I've even recently had her uh, kind of do some role play with my current students. Um, And so (laughs) when the students are a little off on their response, she'll look at them uh, and and just sort of like, you're not supposed to say it that way. (laughs) If if they ask a question, she looks at them and, uh, and then sometimes she'll even correct them, you know, just out of innocence, but she is so ingrained in her because she's grown up with child center play therapy. Yes. And actually I have two related points to that. So I remember shortly after you adopted her, I remember you saying, Brenna, when you have kids of your own, just know that it's okay to throw everything you know about play therapy out the window. <laughs> so I remember you saying that to me, that has always stuck. Yes. And, and then also, it's funny that you mentioned she's been around it her whole life, because so has my son, yeah. and he's almost 14. And I tell therapists and clinicians and my trainees all the time that he has only ever known play therapy, because I've used it as my parenting approach. I've used it as the way that I interact with him. And so he knows it just like your daughter does. And so sometimes, you know, he'll joke and he'll be like, can you not be Miss Brenna right now? (laughs) (laughs) What he thinks of me as like my therapist person. Yes. So so yeah, I mean, when they, when they're surrounded by it, they just learn it and it, you know, it becomes something that they understand very it's very importantly. So yeah, so special. Yes. All right. So thanks so much for giving us a little bit more information about yourself. And then if you wouldn't mind, share with us how you became a play therapist. What was your play therapy journey? Yes, I'd love to do that because uh, I probably had a journey maybe similar to many of your listeners. Uh, I had my uh, completed my master's degree in counseling in uh, Colorado and my particular program really just focused on adults. Uh, they 
just barely touched on adolescence and and their philosophy was, uh, you know, when it comes to children, just work with the parents. Uh, and so that was it. Well, when I went to get my first job as a counselor, they told me, oh, your first client is a child. And I'm like, uh, what? OK. Um, and so and they said, and here's a playroom. And I had absolutely never even heard of the word play therapy before, literally never heard of it. So I just kind of panicked and started reading a a bunch of play therapy books, getting some ideas of things. And then I would uh, scramble and go to some trainings, you know, one training here, another training there. And it was all confusing. And I have this vivid memory of working with this little seven-year-old girl. And um, so I would go to one training and they would say, well, you know, do this directive technique. And so, oh, okay. All right. That's what I'm supposed to do. So I'd go in, you know, kind of nurse and, and start this, uh, some technique that they would show me in the, the play therapy training, um, that was not child center play therapy. I didn't even know there was child center play therapy at that point. And, and the kid would just look at me and say, why do you keep changing what we're doing every time? Wow. <laughs> it's like that was out of the mouth of babe because right. she just wanted to play. And mm-hmm. and she was really doing the work at the at the time of just play therapy. Uh she had been a um a child who had been sexually abused and and she would go and put on uh the police outfit and and uh she would say, uh, what did you do? And then she would look at me and she would say, did you have sex? And I was like, like shocked. I didn't know what I was supposed to say. And, uh, but it it dawned on me, that was exactly how her mother was coming uh, across to her because um, her mom was pretty harsh at the time. And uh, so this child was just playing it out. And and I was just so confused about now, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to do that or I'm supposed to teach her something. And then finally, thank goodness, uh, Gary Landreth did a a training in Colorado at that time. And this was way back in the 1990s, mid 1990s. Uh, he did a, a two day child center play therapy training. And I went there and I was like, oh, yes, this is what aligns with my my own perspective of children. This is how I would naturally do it, except for I've been to all these other trainings and they're saying, no, do this, no, do this. Do, and, and I was getting confused. And so I was like so relieved. Um, and so I just read his book. And then I um, said, you know what, I, I really wanted to get more training. And the only way at that time was for me to basically uh, sell my nice condo in, in Colorado and and give up my hiking lifestyle and everything and my job and move and get my PhD at the University of North Texas. And so that's what I did just so that I could get that type of training. Fortunately, now we have <laughs> these options too, where people don't have to make such a huge sacrifice. But it was a real pleasure in 1996, I went and got my doctorate degree at University of North Texas and uh, trained under Gary Landreth. I was one of the assistants, uh, assistant manager at the Center for Play Therapy. And so I just went through there um, and got my PhD, got a lot of great training, wonderful exposure for the um, the really international specialists they would bring in in play therapy, uh, like Ileana Gill and others like that. And uh, Clark Moustakis, I had the pleasure of meeting. And so then my first job was at the University of uh, South Florida in Tampa. And that's where I met you. And um, I and at that time, they had absolutely no play therapy training. And I was just absolutely determined to make it happen. So I started that uh, play therapy certificate program where we I taught the intro to play therapy, the group play therapy and the filial therapy all in sequentially that you went through and um and uh, then, so I was there about 11 years, and then I moved back to the uh, the Fort Worth, Dallas area so that I could be with my mother. And uh, I've been at the University of North Texas at Dallas, which is different than UNT Denton. 
University of North Texas at Dallas, and I've been uh, training and teaching uh, play therapy there and just ha have had a great time. Really, it's very exciting to me because we have really increased the number of uh, African-American play therapists and uh, Latinx play therapists because of the population uh, in our area. And so we're uh, we're doing some great work there. So I'm really happy about that. So that was really my play therapy journey. And now I'm also um, a practicing play therapist in, in the town where I live. And uh, so I live and eat and breathe it every day. <laughs> Me too. And <laughs> yes, and I always, you know, I've I've talked about this on the podcast in earlier episodes, but I always have felt that I was just at the right place at the right time because you had a pretty short stint in Florida, actually, and for your career anyway. And, mm -hmm. you know, I remember and I shared this in like my earliest episodes, but you would be lecturing a class that had nothing to do with kids and you would just randomly say, and, you know, then when I work with kids and play therapy and then you'd move on. And I just remember it was the same thing where you said you'd never heard of play therapy, yeah. nor had I. And it was one of those things where I just kept in the back of my head, like, what is she talking about? What is this play therapy thing? And so it was the same discovery process for me. And, you know, obviously the graduate certificate program that you started and I was able to participate in that, that moment where you said it clicked with you and you said, this is how I would naturally interact. I, every drive home from that class, and it was an hour from USF to home, I would call my husband and just, oh my gosh. And then we learned this and then you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to reflect feelings and you're supposed to use encouragement. And it was like, you don't know what you don't know, but when you find what you've always needed, it, you just can't believe that it wasn't in your awareness before that moment. Right. Yeah, I, I went through the same thing as a result of you being at USF. So I am very grateful that you were here for a short little bit of time. Yes. Yeah. So knowing how important it is to both of us, and I mean, I really, I'm just grateful that you were part of my journey as my mentor for all these years, but help us understand what in your experience do you think is maybe the one or two or however many reasons you think really stand out for you? Why does child-centered play therapy work? What experientially have you kind of formed as your reasoning for how it's so effective? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So I would say it child center play therapy is respectful to children because it, it honors their developmental needs to play. And young children, and I even work with two-year-olds, two-year-olds um, through uh, elementary school, preschool, elementary school, they just, they want to play. Mm -hmm. And uh, so child center play therapy respects that developmental need. And I think that a lot of children, they want to tell their story. Um, uh, but through play, and, and sometimes adults have kind of maybe conditioned them to uh, say this or that, or believe this or that. Uh, but um, if given the opportunity in that safe environment with the um, well-stocked playroom that's carefully selected toys, then the child will have the opportunity opportunity to play that out. And, um, you know, it, I, I just remember uh, working with uh, children in, in the past, um, uh, like, uh, allowing them to address their needs. So as I mentioned before, that little girl, the first one that I worked with, who was seven years old, had been brought in for sexual abuse. So I remember one session she came in and she, I finally got the idea, just let, you know, her play and, and, and provide the child center play therapy, therapeutic responses. So this child was playing and she's playing in the dollhouse and she took five of the dolls and put them in one little room. And then she had uh, one of the adult dolls walking around saying, be quiet. You're too loud. Be quiet. Behave. And I'm like thinking, okay, you know, this doesn't sound like this has much to do with sexual abuse. And I just have the sense of something else is going on. I don't know what it's going on. But so she was doing that. And then later the mom told me in, in, that uh, 
after the session, she said, oh, yeah, well, we were just recently uh, evicted from our apartment and we had to move in with a family from church. And I'm like, oh, that's what this child was playing out, that she is now in this other person's house and the the five of them and their family are stuck in this one room. And she's constantly hearing probably either from mom or maybe the family they live with, you know, be quiet. Don't do that. You know, and so she was playing that out. And if I had taken a more directive approach of saying, okay, we're now we're going to address your, your sexual abuse, then I would have missed what was on her mind. And her mind at that time is this huge adjustment we've had to make because now we are, are virtually homeless. So uh, to me, that's just that example of, of letting the child lead the play where they need to, respecting and honoring that. Um, and then, you know, in contrast to um, my early days, uh, again, working with children, I remember one of these techniques I had learned is uh, using some yarn on um, on your fingers and, and doing some of these cat cat's cradle type things going back and forth and then trying to use it as a metaphor with uh, children. And so I remember I used it as a metaphor with this 10 year old girl who was going through a divorce uh, her parents were going through a divorce and um, she was really smart. And I'm like, oh, you know, here's this string. And sometimes it gets all tangled up. Uh, uh, does this remind you of anything in your life? And so this smart 10 year old goes, yeah, it kind of reminds me of my parents. They're getting a divorce and now they're, it, you know, life is just all knotted up and and I can't figure it out. And I was like, oh, yay. Uh, I figured it out how to get kids to talk about divorce. And so uh, then I uh, used it with another uh, little girl who was like six years old, who was also going through divorce. And so I was doing the same thing. And uh, does this, uh, this yarn getting all knotted up, does it remind you of anything? And uh, she looks at me and she goes, well, yeah, sometimes my shoestrings get tied in a knot. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, that metaphor went right over a six-year-old's head. They're not going to understand that. <laughs> so uh, that's that's that idea of, you know, just allowing the child to play and take that uh, where they need to. Um, and so, I, and I'm always amazed of how that ha that happens as we, in child center play therapy, allow the child to work out their own difficulties, trusting their, their, um, their self-actualizing potential to go where they need to. So recently I had a, a little girl who came in and she was having some difficulties with sleeping on her own, uh, do some, she was just some nervous about a few things. And so she used to, she was going in and kind of crashing in her parents' rooms or, or uh, they would sometimes say, well, go, you know, sleep with your sister. Um, but um, she kept, was having this struggle, nervousness. So she came in the playroom and um, I had the sand tray out with all of our little sand tray figurines as well. Uh, and so she took this uh, lion and put it in the sand tray and she's walking around with a lion and, and, she, and the lion was going, I need a bed, I need a bed. So I'm just reflecting, oh, the lion's really angry. It, it needs a, a bed, a safe place to be. So then she finds these little um, kind of, shiny rock type things and lays them out and creates a bed for them. The lion lays down. And then she goes to the sand tray. We have all the, with all these sand trays, just a ton of different animals and things. And she finds a little lamb and the lamb comes into the sand and is going, I need a place to sleep. I need a place to sleep. And so then she, she finds a shell for the, the lamb to lay in. Um, and, uh, then she finally finds this little bug, you know, like it was a, a bug with little legs sticking out the bugs going around going, I need a place to sleep. I need the place to sleep. Goes over to the lion and is like, can I sleep with you? And the lion's like, ah, quit waking me up. And then the, the bug goes over to the little, um, to the lamb, it's like, I need a place to sleep. And the lamb's like, no, go away, go away. And so then finally, this little girl creates, uh, gets like two shells in and uh, covers the little bug in the shell. And it's like, I'm trying to find a 
a place to sleep. And I'm reflecting that bug really is doing everything it knows how to find a safe place where it feels comfortable to sleep. And, you know, and the lion's like, you're fine there. You're fine. You're going to be okay. And then finally the bug kind of settles in and has a good night's sleep. And so, you know, this little girl was really playing out her experience of not being able to sleep and getting to the point of mastery so that she could find that settled place where she felt safe. And I'm, you know, reflecting the feelings of she's confused. She doesn't know where to go or it, it's confused. It doesn't know where to go. So I'm reflecting feelings. I'm trying to facilitate understanding. It just wants a good night's sleep and it needs a safe place. It needs to be understood. And through that process, she was able to kind of resolve this difficulty she was having with sleeping. And, um, and you know, and it, then it, it got better. She was able to sleep more on her own. And so that's part of why I really believe play therapy is so helpful uh, with children is that they, they can work out their own problems if we give them the, the that unconditional positive regard, the genuineness, the congruence, you know, all of Axelheim's eight basic principles and create that safe space where they can work it out as we give the therapeutic responses. Right. And I mean, I, I love those stories because I think they're just so helpful to illustrate what's going on in the playroom from a child-centered perspective. And, you know, it's interesting that you brought up sleeping and you brought up some of these other things, even with the eviction, because I can't tell you the number of times a child plays something out in my playroom and then either that week or the next week I have a meeting with the parents scheduled already. So it just falls in the same week span. Mm -hmm. And before they say a word to me, I say, I'm curious if there's anything going on with sleeping or I'm curious if there's anything going on with bath time or I'm curious if there's anything going on with teeth brushing. And they they think I like have a magic eight ball or something. They're like, how in the world did you know that? And I'm like, because that's what the child played out this week. And mm -hmm. I mean, that is the beauty of the model, right? Where they came in for usually, I mean, I don't think most people reach out because there's a bath time struggle, right? So, I mean, that was not on the docket of things we have to address. <laughs> but as the child is working through things, it inevitably becomes part of the process. And that is so amazing to me. I call it the magic of child-centered play therapy, right? Because all of a sudden now I have insight that there's something going on or the child wouldn't have brought it into the play. And right. that is the beauty of the process where the child says, I'm working on these big things, but sometimes I need to work on these little things. And sometimes, you know, like I'm in a room with five people and we're constantly being told to be quiet. I need to sort that out in my brain because it's new and it's different and it's confusing. And mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. All right. So speaking of loving child-centered mm -hmm. therapy, what, what do you see as your standouts for why you love this approach? Well, you know, it, uh, first of all, it, it's fun for kids and it's really fun and fascinating for me as the the therapist because I'm I'm witnessing this transformation as we're talking about and and in a way that it has not been scripted but is much more natural um and so uh so that part I I love that part it's it's fun for the kids the kids are having fun and sometimes they're just really uh working hard um, but doing it in a way that is fun. Um, and uh, I think that it also, I love it because, you, as you mentioned, kind of seeing that magic happen, um, seeing the the child resolve their own difficulties in a, in a child-led way. Um, so like, I remember a, a, a three-year-old boy I worked with, he, his mom brought him in because he was about to get kicked out of uh, his second preschool uh, for being quote disobedient. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so the mom was very concerned about this of course. And mom said, well, he's, he's quote disobedient uh, because the teachers tell him to sit down in the chair and, and color this, um, this, picture that they've asked him to color and he doesn't do it. And so he'll get out of the chair and wander around. And then 
uh, then they uh, make him miss the outdoor playtime. So he'll finish the picture and then he doesn't do it. And then they put him in time out. Um, and so this little three-year-old boy, he just, you know, he, he was not having it. And I, I, it reminds me of one of your podcasts about how kids cannot be manipulative, you know, and in, in this sense for a three-year-old, you kind of think, you know, how is it that a preschool teacher would expect a child to sit down for a whole hour and, and color when there are all these fun, uh, other toys beckoning them in within the room? So it was, you know, it was one of those things of, yeah, I'm not seeing this as a child being disobedient. It's that the the school uh, and the teacher has not yet figured out how, how to help meet his needs. So anyway, this uh, boy, he comes in and he starts playing with the puppets and he gets this little dog puppet in and he's like, the, you know, the, the dog was wanting to chase the ball and do all this stuff. And then this he got the witch puppet and the witch is flying over, flies and snatches the dog puppet and like throws him across the room and says, you're in timeout. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, uh, you know, I was thinking, oh, you know, this is pretty much his experience in, in uh, preschool. And so I'm reflecting feelings that the dog is really scared. That witch is so angry. And the dog is so scared. He was just trying to play. He's confused too. Um, and, uh, you know, now he's away from his friends and some, you know, narrating all this and and uh, uh, reflecting this. And within a couple of sessions, he got to the point, he play, would replay this like several times. And so definitely was this, this theme of uh, co- conflict, relational conflict, and good versus bad, and all this, and you know the witch, you're a bad dog, you're a bad dog, and so f- finally, uh, a couple uh, sessions later, same thing, you know, the dog's chasing the ball, trying to play, the witch comes and is, tries to grab him, but this time the dog like bites at the witch and says. I'm not bad. You're bad. And he throws the witch over into timeout. <laughs> wow. And so, you know, it was like he he finally had this epiphany of, you know, that I'm not bad. I'm just, you know, a dog trying to have fun. I'm just a kid trying to have fun. Obviously, we want we don't want the child to bite his teacher and throw him in timeout. But <laughs> but that was but that that was just that that sense of you know, wait a minute, I, I, he was almost saying, no, I have a right to be respected here. I'm a, I'm a kid. I have a right to be respected to, to play. And, um, and so, you know, he, he started working that out. And the biggest thing there that was, uh, that I love about play therapy is that he shifted his, uh, self-esteem. He shifted the way that he was, perceiving himself and others. And so instead of seeing himself as bad, uh, he was seeing himself more as empowered and being able to stand up for himself. And so from there, you know, I was able to give mom some feedback and even offer to uh, give the teacher some feedback so that the the teacher could have a different uh, understanding of his needs. Um, And so in, in that you know, really worked out well, but that's, those are some of the reasons I love play therapy. It's like the, the child is having fun and they're solving their own problems um, through the process. And you actually bring up an interesting point that I think is worth spending a couple moments on, because I think when you are a child, when you're a play therapist period, but specifically when you're a child-centered play therapist, I think we wear lots of hats. We talk mm-hmm. about that a lot in the podcast too. But I think one of the most important and significant platforms that we've been given is to give adults who love kids. So this is principals, teachers, guidance counselors, daycare workers, coaches, whatever, whatever adults that are pouring into these kids' lives and then they become our clients. It's about giving them a different perspective, isn't it? Like so much of the time, I feel like I'm doing education and I'm doing explanation and I'm doing developmental understanding and I'm doing all of these things because, you know, this three-year-old is not going to succeed in the current environment, right? And so it's not about saying he's bad or you're bad or you're the witch and he's the dog. It's none of those things, right? It's like saying 
but how do we make this successful for everyone? And I think so much of the time, it's a perspective shift. It's Mm -hmm. a different frame or different lens through which you view the behavior. Because if you see it as a little boy who just really wants to get up and be active and have fun, it's no longer disobedient. It's no longer defiant. It's no longer resistant. It's give him opportunities to do the things that he wants to do and help him find the balance. And why I think play therapy is so amazing to speak to the things that you love about it. There's almost always a role reversal that takes place when a child is sorting out who they are and what they want to be because Mm -hmm. self-actualization is, I know that I'm capable of being better. Right. So when you have this child that role reverses Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden goes, no, you go to timeout. You're the bad one. You know, it's (laughs) like they realize that there's good and bad in all things and they find the balance and balance is always healthy. And so Yeah, I love I love watching that process, too. And, you know, I think that that's one of the things that we have to really champion is helping people understand a different perspective, because when I meet with parents for consultations, I feel I feel like so much of what I do is help them understand through a different framework. Mm -hmm. why the child is behaving the way that they are. And then it doesn't necessarily make it easier, but the because it's still frustrating or it's still difficult or it's still whatever, Mm -hmm. but at least with an understanding of why Mm -hmm. you can then make appropriate decisions as a result of your understanding. And I think that's really powerful. Right. Yeah, exactly. And and that really leads into a a logical net step for many parents Um, and maybe even teachers, is the child-parent relationship therapy and or the child-teacher relationship therapy. And um, for for many kids, you know, I'll see them and they'll make that progress and they'll have that shift. And then it becomes clear to me that uh, a parent, and sometimes it's not the parent necessarily that brings them, but a spouse needs the the, um, child-parent relationship therapy. therapy. And I've, I've done that before with um, some kids like this boy and say, okay, you know what, let's, let's uh, have dad come in and, um, and we'll go through the child parent relationship therapy. And uh, because sometimes I know that, you know, their lives are very busy and they're basically not going to do the therapy at home, the, the practice therapy session, I'll have it in session. Um, and in so I'll just say, well, this time you bring your son and and uh, then I can uh, kind of be there and coach along the way uh, in a live format. Uh, it's helpful, very helpful if it's recorded and then you can look back at it. Uh, but uh, I found that some uh, it's just not going to happen that way. So I have to make some adaptations. And, uh, and and it's it's interesting seeing that process because uh, just the empowerment of children after they've been through child center play therapy and they get that sense of empowerment. I just remember this one uh, boy <laughs> playing. Um, he was with dad in the playroom. He's at the at the puppet stage and uh, he's he's doing his thing with his little puppets and saying, "I want to fight! I want to fight!" And and the dad, although he had been taught to reflect feelings and to uh and to try to track play behavior this dad just could not help himself and and said well uh yeah you, you those puppets shouldn't be fighting they should be sharing and this little boy this 3 year old boy pokes out of the uh the uh uh the puppet stage and says daddy stop it <laughs> just listen Mm, wow. And, you know, and I know I was like, wow. And I'm like, okay, I, I I need not say anything more. And the dad got it to his credit. Dad got it. He's like, okay. You know, and 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 then we were able to I was able to process with the dad, you know, remember that? And he's like, I know. I asked a question. I was trying to teach him to share because he fights with this little brother all the time. I know. And he really, he told me, and I was so proud of that little boy. It's like, yeah, dad needed to hear that, you know, you know, stop trying to teach me, understand that I'm frustrated that brother will not share the toys. Just understand me, dad, you know, and, and, and so it was just, uh, you know, again, one of those uh, powerful things of, uh, and where the boy was able to ask for what he needed and, um, and, uh, you know, and the and the dad recognizing, okay, my son is frustrated with me, 
because I'm not giving him what he needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those are, those are such precious moments. And I do, I do CPRT at my center. I train CPRT and I think it's so valuable. I think it, it makes such a difference when you can clearly see the child has done as much work as the child is capable of doing. And they, I, I typically say that it's like a, you know, child starts here and, and parent starts here and the child can only come so far, right? In certain scenarios, parents mm -hmm. then have to meet the child from the other direction. And yes. I think transitioning to the the parent training really is so helpful in, in scenarios like that. So yeah, thanks for talking about CPRT because I learned that from you. So there we go. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's kind of do a, a combination question here. So I'm curious, if you feel that you, I know when you were in Florida, you worked with the homeless population. I remember you working at Metropolitan Ministries. Yes. So I know that that was one population I'm aware of, but do you have any specific populations with whom you've worked in your career and specifically maybe with natural disasters? I'm aware of your work after the tsunami, and I know you've probably done some other things since. So what have you noticed as far as outcomes because let me let me give you the back story on why I'm curious about us discussing this, because we we're always looking for evidence based practice. Right. We're always looking for the proof of efficacy with an approach. And so there are a lot of really helpful meta analyses that have been conducted. Yes. You've been a part of those. D. Ray has done them. So we know, practically speaking, we can find journal articles that talk about the efficacy with all types of diagnoses, all types of symptoms, all types of races and, and backgrounds. So specifically though, I'm curious, what has your experience been practically speaking when you work with different populations and what have those outcomes been? Yes, yes. Well, speaking of uh, disaster mental health, yes, I, I uh, began working in disaster mental health uh, actually when I got to Florida because there were so many hurricanes and there was what? such an opportunity. Uh, but it was interesting in when you talk about the research and the evidence base, it, it was I, I found it to be, uh, um, despite my trying, very difficult to do research after disaster mental health because of the IRB process was took so long to try to get the IRB process through. And uh, and and sorry to interrupt you, but for the new people of the field, can you, yes. under, can you explain IRB <laughs> Institutional Review Board, where it allows you to have permission to uh, do uh, research studies? And so, and that's different than giving your informed consent. You can give them an informed consent in you know a matter of minutes, but to go through the Institutional Review Board IRB process. It's very long, lengthy, and usually by the time it's done, you know your your window of opportunity is missed. Um, so, uh, but actually, one of the most recent disaster mental health um, play therapy responses we've done was in Puerto Rico after uh, Hurricane Maria, and so that was really fascinating. Where I I trained um, some Spanish speaking play therapists in how to uh, to do disaster response play therapy, which I've I've illustrated in some videos and in uh, journal articles and such, um, and so uh, we work with them, and you know that was a very very powerful outcome, I believe, uh, going to the to the place uh, and working with the the parents and the teachers that are there and then providing some disaster response play therapy uh and i think the one thing that really stands out to for a lot of that is just that the the people feeling that they are um that that they are honored that they are they are recognized that their their pain is is um uh is worthy in a, a sense to be healed and uh, so uh, in that particular time in Puerto Rico, uh, is I don't know if you remember, but there was um, a lot of, I guess, um, some political things going on. Uh, and so one of the things that I found to be very helpful in disaster response play therapy, and even with uh, different populations of play therapy, is going in with that cultural humility. Um, and going in with some cultural responsiveness, beginning with the cultural humility, trying to be a learner, trying to honor their perspective. And so after Hurricane Maria, there was a real sense of the people 
that um, that they had been kind of slighted, that they had been uh, just kind of thrown some paper towels and here's some paper towels that was being thrown by some political figures. And, uh, and, and they felt like, but, but you're not, you, people are not giving us what we need. Mm -hmm. And so when we were there, um, it, there was that real sense of uh, being able to meet the very personal mental health needs. And we, we trained some local uh, uh, mental health professionals in play therapy. And, and then we provided direct play therapy. Uh, and, and that, uh, it, w it was very powerful because there, with the cultural humility, we could understand that there was such a pride in their in their culture, in the Puerto Rican culture, um, and uh, the the play therapy with the children and even with the adolescents that we were working with uh, really uh, uh, brought that forward and allowed them to do that. And even in one of my articles, I, I did on. Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. I gave the example of working with the um, children, adolescents. We kind of set up little stations. So we set up a, a some child-centered play therapy stations, some sand tray stations, and for and then uh, music therapy stations for older kids. And uh, like this uh, one young adolescent uh, girl, she was. Um, she was, we were doing some music therapy with her and uh, we asked her, can you think of a, a song that kind of represents what you're doing? Now, this is not part of child center play therapy, but I'm just saying this as more of a, an illustration of honoring people's um, background and, and their cultural uh, needs. And so this uh, young girl she said, yeah, she she really liked that song. It's called Scars to Your Beautiful by, um, uh, I think it's Alicia Kara. And uh, so she was, and we asked her, you know, what, what lyrics do you like? And she said, well, the lyrics she liked was, uh, but there's hope that's waiting for you in the dark. Um, and it, that part was so representative because as you might remember after Hurricane Maria, uh, yeah. Puerto Rico lost power for like weeks and water. Weeks. Yeah. And, yeah. And water. And so there was that dark and she said, but there's hope for you waiting in the dark. You should know you're beautiful just the way you are. And you don't have to change a thing. The world could change. It's hard. No scars to your beautiful, your stars and we're beautiful. And uh, and that it was such a powerful thing because this young lady was saying that's how she sees Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Puerto Rico's been in the dark and and we're beautiful just the way we are. We don't have to change where this is our culture. We honor our culture. And she was saying, you know, Puerto Rico is beautiful. Uh, and she was as a young lady, as a young Puerto Rican lady, I am beautiful. I don't need to change who I am. Uh, and I, I felt like that was also such a, a good representation of even child center play therapy that we were doing actually in the same room with uh, all these kids that we were working with. Uh, you know, kids just kind of like being in the dark and they're just they're wanting someone to honor them, their developmental needs, their their needs to process the, the trauma that they've been through and to recognize that they're beautiful and to in and to just uh, give them that opportunity to show that they're beautiful focusing on the beauty not the scars but the beauty of it and um so those i think those are some things that really stand out to me about working in disaster mental health uh in and disaster response play therapy giving folks that opportunity to do that yeah. And I mean, as soon as you said that last line, it just reminded me of the CPRT rule of thumb, focus on the donut, not the whole, right? Because there's so much in the way of let's fix this. Let's work on this. This is broken. This is bad. This is what we need to amend. This is how, whatever. And the reality is sometimes the, the frame shift, right? Is to say, but what we have is good. Yes. And what's already present is good. And we're going to celebrate what is here. Mm -hmm. And you know, in the midst of disaster, in the midst of difficulty, it's easy to focus on 
all of the things that are missing. But the reality is sometimes it's more important for kids specifically, but for all of us, right, to mm -hmm. say, but what's here is really good. And we're going to celebrate and be proud of those things. Yes. Yeah. Um, I love that. Yeah. All right. So let's wrap up with a final question. I'm curious mm -hmm. what your thoughts are. What advice would you have for new child-centered play therapists? So either <clears throat> newly graduated, very young in age. So this may be their first entrance into the field, or mm -hmm. I actually have a lot of clinicians reaching out to me. They've had a completely separate career yes. and in their forties or fifties discovered child-centered play therapy. And they're like, how have I not done this my whole life? So now later in life, they're actually new to the field, even though they've had a career in a different arena. So what are your best thoughts or tips or advice for them? Yes. Well, uh, absolutely. Number one, get supervision of uh, reviewing your videos. Uh, and I've, I supervise and I've seen so many people. If, if you will do the work of getting the permission to record your play therapy sessions and then bring them every week and go through it uh, with your child center play therapy supervisor, that's when people really can get solid, you know, and we agree. Yes. And it's, it's just, and so I'm hard to interrupt you, but I hated it when you did that to me. Yeah. I hated sitting in that lab. I hated watching videos <laughs> on the old VHS tapes. Yes. Put in. But I, it's funny, the training that I do right now, the year long training, I watch the same process every time it starts. I'm like, you're going to be submitting videos and we're going to watch them together. And they're like, no, and, <laughs> and it's awkward and it's uncomfortable, but the transformation, I mean, we talk about the transformation kids have in the playroom, right? The transformation, clinically speaking, that happens when you have someone that can watch your videos and in real time say, okay, right there, that was an effective use of this. Okay, that was a missed opportunity. Okay, what's going on thematically here? There is nothing like that That's for right therapist to have someone that can point out the the wins and the opportunities for growth simultaneously it just makes you so much more aware you can't get it in any other way i really don't think so. right yeah because when people just try to report oh yeah this happened in the session this happened in the session they don't know what they don't know so they're they're not aware that they missed maybe an eye roll of this of the child or the or the you know uh, little short facial expressions uh, of the child, and um, and and so it's just so powerful when you can have the supervision uh, with the videos. And right. then I would also say uh, go to trainings um, on first. On, if you're learning child center play therapy, first just only go to trainings on child center play therapy. Otherwise, people get confused too quickly, and then they go, "Oh, uh, you know." And there are many other wonderful play therapy approaches, but then they get confused. Oh, uh, prescriptive play therapy does it this way, but Adlerian does it this way, but Jungian does it this way, but cognitive behavioral does it this way, and then they just get all confused. So I would say uh, when you're starting off, just go to child center play therapy uh, trainings. It could be on particular problems, like if it's divorce or foster children or sexual abuse on different things. Uh, and then maybe different populations of like uh, Latinx or African-American or, you know, Puerto Rican, Asian, you know, and so just focus on that. Then later you can spread out after you've got, you know, that really solid foundation of trainings. And then the other thing is I would say do a lot of reading specifically again in child center play therapy of journal articles of books um we have a, a book i've just been working on that's coming out in uh is called contemporary case studies and for uh, clinical mental health of children and adolescents and it has several chapters in there on child center play therapy uh with different issues like uh, uh divorce and um African American biracial uh and uh adjustment difficulties all that so do the reading of in-depth case studies i think that's very helpful uh and um do the training and get that supervision and then finally just really just enjoy the journey you know it's it's fun you'll make progress over the years and so and yeah. 
And, and it is fun. I mean, I think you mentioned that earlier, why you love child-centered play therapy. I think, you know, I, I joke all the time. I'm never going to have an existential crisis about is what I'm doing, what I should be doing. You know, you have like CPAs or hairdressers or whatever, they hit a certain age and they're like, is this really all my life is about? And they like completely uproot their lives and they change their careers and whatever. And I joke all the time. I love what I do. I love my job. I love my career. I love the model. I love working with kids. I never question if what I do matters. I I mean, I think there is nothing better than watching kids go from hurt and sad and angry and broken and struggling to thriving and happy and healthy. I mean, I I don't know what you could do that's more rewarding than that and have fun while you do it. So it's just kind of like you get that on top of it. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much for your time. I'm so excited to have had this hour with you and thank you for your wisdom and your knowledge and sharing everything that has been part of a very long and distinguished career for you. So, um, and you know how very much I appreciate you from my career path because you were the reason it all began. So we're just so proud of you and everything that you've accomplished and just sharing, you know, you're like Johnny Appleseed putting out the seeds throughout the the United States and even the world. So thank you so much for what you do. So, yeah, we're, we're going to grow a whole bunch of really solid child-centered play therapists, hopefully. Yeah, so thank you so much. It was so great to be with you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you for listening to the Play Therapy Podcast with Dr. Brenna Hicks. For more episodes and resources, please go to www.playtherapypodcast.com.